Cartographers do not generally distinguish between making maps that is engaging in cartographic practice and the consideration of cartography as a practice. It is in fact often assumed that the former subsumes the latter, that internal considerations sufficiently answer external ones. We've seen, however, that many questions, questions of motivation, of ethics, of aesthetics, just to mention a few, cannot be adequately addressed internally. Uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> the addressed, that is, is to say, as questions of fundamental or craft practice. Appeals to map making, appeals to, well, uh, all right. Sorry. Yeah, I can just do Sire. All right. Uh, well, oh, what did I just do again? Just okay. That yes. Appeals to map making as uh, to map making as storytelling or to map making as science are, are similarly similarly unsatisfactory. These questions and many others concern the connection of a practice of cartography to a world in which cartography is practiced. Many people in Many people, ranging from Dennis Wood in his CP article, Cartography is Dead, to Matthew Edney in his new book, Cartography, the Ideal and Its History, have pointed out that a great many practitioners hold a wide variety of peculiar, confused, and often contradictory ideas about cartography, and, what this ha and that this happenstance seriously confuses the cartographic discourse. Edney, in his new book, dissects and pathologizes the roots, symptoms, and consequences of what he identifies as the pervasive pro problematic ideal of cartography. He identifies at least 58 deeply flawed pre-convictions sustained by this ideal, and he groups them under 10 preconceptions. His answer, though, is in itself deeply problematic. He, he wants us to abandon not only the enshrined ideal, but the very term cartography as well, in favor of a processual approach that based on map production, map circulation, and map consumption. He writes that map scholars must stop saying maps are and instead say map X mapping is while being clear about what the criteria is that makes X a valid label. X in this case must be chosen from a list of, of 14 map modes, modes that he somehow imagines are ontologically central to mapping. In short, he wants us to jettison one problematic dogma just to adopt another one every bit as peculiar and confused. His processual taxonomic proposal is clearly wrong, in, in part because it's founded upon elements that are not foundational, and as well because it focuses almost entirely on differences between individual maps, effectively hiding what is common to all. And it is through map commonalities that cartography actually works. The differences are largely anecdotal or accidental. What we need is a conceptual theory of cartography, one that comprehensively includes all the needs for maps, all the ways maps can be made, and one that presents a coherent explanation of what it is that is essential and why. We can look at that, but first let's have a glance at some of the usual suspects. Uh, a very large number of cartographic practitioners adhere to the notion that cartography is essentially the craft of map making and the great majority of cartographic manuals from Ptolemy onwards reinforce this assumption. On one occasion while serving as a map competition judge, my nomination of this map for an award elicited howls of objection from my fellow judges. I argued it was an extraordinary production, a useful and usable map that was clear, concise, and elegant. Unfortunately, some of the other judges found my suggestion fundamentally objectionable, and instead of engaging with the map artifact, they chose to attack me for blasphemy and for heresy. 
This faith-based reliance on fundamentals, on rules, on there being a right way to make a map breaks down when we look at all the different kinds of map there are, at all the different needs for maps, at all the different uses to which maps can be put, and at all the ways people use even a single map artifact. All these variations cannot and never can be met by any single set of fundamental rules for constructing an artifact. So-called map fundamentals are useful, but they're also contingent. And if different rules apply in different situations, then they are anything but fundamental. There have many, been many in the community who have called upon science as the answer to all questions, and this is hardly surprising. After all, science has long been the normative paradigm for intellectual activity. Who would not want to be seen as a scientist? Clearly, science guides and governs a wide variety of aspects and elements involved in cartographic practice, but... While science can serve cartography and cartography can serve science, they remain fundamentally different entities and practices. An indiscriminate conflation of the two inevitably leads to significant misunderstandings. Science makes statements about the world. A scientific statement is known to be either true or false by the invocation of fact. Normally, science provides us with analytical judgments, judgments that are reached by taking apart a given proposition within the structure of a given system or paradigm. Science works by isolating particular facts that are, that are then examined and judged both independently and in aggregate as true or false. Analytical judgments lie at the heart of science. Cartography, by contrast, provides propositions that feed synthetic judgments, judgments which, as the name implies, arise out of a synthesis of elements, a synthesis based on organized propositions. Cartography does not examine the propositions it explicitly or implicitly puts forward, but instead strives to frame its propositions with whatever appeal will convince its audience that its propositions are facts and that the facts are true and pertinent even if they're not true, and even if they're not pertinent. A statement that appeals to facts grounded in a reasonable appearance of truth can be convincing, but it cannot be called scientific. Thus, we can see that there is a clear relationship between cartography and science, and while either one can be an invaluable support to the other, they are not at all the same thing and are really quite fundamentally different. Maps are, without question, communication vehicles, but unfortunately most people adhere to what I.A. Richards long ago called the vulgar packaging theory of communication. This is, in a nutshell, that knowledge, or fact, or truth, or a story, or whatever, is transferred from the map maker's cognitive realm to the user's, and that the use, all that the user does is unwrap the package. Communication, however, simply does not work like that, and maps do not either. A map is not a packet of facts to be delivered to the user. Maps are not simply read, but are in fact negotiated or performed. The map artifact is recognized, read, and interpreted in whatever way the map user sees fit, and the artifact can only convey to the user such things as the user is prepared to see in and to read into it. The maker sets the stage, they prime the pump, they lay the trap, but the maker then disappears and has no further role to play. It is the user that transfigures the artifact into a map. True, the user normally interprets the signs they find physically inscribed on the artifact itself, but, in the context, but the contextual paradigm for the interpretation of the artifact, and even for finding the signs, is determined by the conceptual placement the user chooses to give to the artifact on a horizon of mapping. It is that horizon that provides the contextual framing. Thus, it is the user that decides this artifact is a map. It is a map of this type, and one engages a map of this type in this way. Some other terms for this decision mechanism are experience and literacy, and the results of the mechanism feeds back into the process both immediately and over the longer term. In some ways, this resembles the experience encountered by Charles Yu's narrator in his book How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, while reading a text using a device called a textural analysis, object analysis device, or TOAD. 
As the narrator was reading, the text could be seen changing both ahead of and behind his reading. The narrator's act of reading was dynamically altering the text, not only for future readings, but as his current reading progressed. We can see that the map maker, far from making a map to gift to the user's cognitive realm, instead creates an artifact with which to shape the user's reading. Should the user decide to employ that artifact, it will be interpreted in an ongoing performance that transforms and transfigures the artifact into a map. Okay, so we can see that the map maker is really only an artificer, making an artifact that the user might choose to transfigure. Complicating this, the maker will not be present when the user performs the transfiguration. Only the artifact will be present. The artifact alone, however, is not really enough to affect the transfiguration. The user has to come to the encounter properly prepared. Before anyone can be a map user, they must know what a map is and what to expect from one. This literacy must cover the idea of a map, a notion of how a map is used, and an ideal of what makes a map a good map. And what makes a good map? I've, I've called the subject of this literacy mapicity. And in order to be a map user, that user will have had to assimilate a conversance with mapicity as it is defined for their society and culture. Thus, to, it is to a potential user's conversance with mapicity that the map maker must pitch their artifact's appeal. The artifact must be synthesized in such a way that the user will say, this artifact is a map, it is a map of this type, one engages a map of this type in this way, and that this is a good map. We can thus see that the map artifact, while the primary artifactual vehicle for map communication, is not the whole of cartography, nor are the technicalities of map making or the instrumentality of map use. Such concerns apply to particular aspects of particular artifacts, but cartography concerns all aspects of all maps. We know that whatever its form, whatever its topic or intent, whatever its material or technology or execution, each and every and any map must do three things. It must be useful, it must be usable, and it must be persuasive. Only if it can do these three things can it achieve its core ontological goal, that of persuading someone of something. Maps have no other reason to exist. No one will consult a map for which there is no use. No one can use a map that is not usable. And no one will use a map they do not believe. As Arthur Danto pointed out, in practice it is the function of rhetoric to cause the audience of a discourse to take a certain attitude toward the subject of that discourse, to be caused to see that subject in a certain light. Usefulness, usability, and persuasiveness are, we know, the core rhetorical appeals. And this shows that the one thing common to all maps is that they are rhetorical vehicles. Useful, usable, persuasive, end of the story, ontologically speaking, that is. The rest is epistemology, and it is in the epistemological aspects that the differences between different kinds of maps, different types of map users, different types of map use all come in. Aspects like art, science, craft, semiotics, cultural literacy, all the contingent and or technological aspects of tools and materials, as well as the thing people have called map language, graphicity, or whatnot, are all contingent variables in the equation. These epistemological aspects can and do vary with time, place, use, need, and user, and together make up what I've called mapicity. Mapicity is that set of things that make a map a map for the member of a particular community of understanding, and it is the recognition of mapicity in an artifact that both prompts and allows someone encountering the artifact to read it, accept it, and employ it as a map. Mapicity also provides the criteria by which the artifact's value as a map is judged. Mapicity has, as we can see, a great number of elements, and some years ago I showed that we can organize these elements into dimensions, or registers of understanding. This organization allows us to explore the dimensions either individually or in conjunction with others to gain a fuller and more sophisticated understanding of cartographic theory and practice. 
We must not lose sight, however, of the fact that the individual dimensions or registers are only views or prospects of map epistemology. Traditional cartographic theories, rooted in what Edney is called the ideal and his own construct of modes, and all the existing postmodern critiques of the map, fall into the trap of accepting one or other, or maybe a couple, of these limited epistemological perspectives as the whole ball of the practice. What binds all mapping activities together at the ontological level, making, reading, analysis, calculation, use, all the technicalities of map making, all the instrumentality of map use, all the myriad types, scales, needs, uses, names, everything is persuasive communication. And persuasive communication is affected, persuasive communication happens through rhetorical argumentation. Map communication and not, and never is a situation where a map maker cart explains something to a map user. Both the artifact maker and the artifact user are operating within communal mapicity spaces that may or may not overlap, and each is making culturally based assumptions about the other. The maker makes assumptions about what the user will accept understand and learn from the map artifact they prepare, and the user makes assumptions about the maker's intentions, as well as about the assumptions the maker has made about the users. Thus, the map maker creates an artifact that the recipient may or may not accept, may or may not read, and may or may not interpret in any manner resembling the hopes or expectations of the maker. Basically, it, Ultimately, it is the person who chooses to be a map user that transfigures the maker's artifact into a map. Here, then, is the groundwork for the conceptual theory of cartography we need for future scholarship. It provides, it provides a tremendous scope for further investigation and noble prospects for useful insight. I've addressed much of this material before piecemeal in the past, and I've skipped a lot of detail in this brief introduction, and there's certainly a lot more work to be done, but this is clearly the way forward for cartography. Many, including Edney, would have us move or remove cartography to accommodate the map. I, on the other hand, insist that we must relativize the map to accommodate multiplicative cartographies. The end.